Welcome, Bay community members. I am going to go ahead and get this party started. Welcome to another edition of Parenting and Mental Health tonight. It's the sleep edition. I was inspired by one of the local school counselors and some of her insight into some of her students talking about students' um, inattention and lack of sleep. And so I decided to focus on sleep tonight. And as parents, we've all been there. When we first had a newborn, uh, we didn't get any sleep. And we definitely noticed a change. So in ourselves, I'm gonna go through a lot of the recent data related to sleep, what lack of sleep does, what increased sleep does. When we talk about increased sleep, we're talking about getting eight hours of sleep a night. But first, what I would like to show is a video. Uh, this is from Maryland Public Television. It is something on uh, getting increased sleep. And we are gonna go over what that looks like. Stop sharing for a second, sorry about that. Hi everybody. So I'm gonna share a different window and we're gonna bring up, or maybe I can actually get it to work. Oh, no, it didn't work. Okay, so today we are going to watch a movie first, and then we're going to get into why sleep is so important. So I'm going to play this video. Uh, hopefully everyone can see this. And we'll watch this, and then we'll come back. Oh, you know what? Before I do that. I'm gonna make sure that when I share, I'm sharing for sound. I am, okay, good. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this video and we'll come back in a few minutes. You hear the alarm and find yourself wishing for just 10 more minutes of sleep. If that scenario sounds familiar, you're like many Americans. Do the math. We should spend about one third of our lives sleeping. That's if we get about eight hours of sleep every night. Nowadays, people have a lot of difficulty getting enough sleep because their jobs get in the way, family gets in the way, and there's a lot of non-traditional jobs that require you to work non-traditional hours. When I first started, I had to do three 12-hour shifts. They are split between days and nights, so you'd have to do a stretch of days and then a stretch of nights, which was uh, never fun. My wife would definitely say, you know, I'm more irritable. You're being cranky. I'd be short with her. Our overall health is impacted greatly by the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep that you get. Sleep deprivation is considered six hours or less. Sleep deprivation is dangerous. It's really hard. I found there were times when I was just falling asleep nursing him, falling asleep just sitting in a chair, but I just wasn't getting enough sleep. I was worried about driving, having to drive him to doctor's appointments because I knew I was tired and I probably shouldn't have been driving. According to the Centers for Disease Control, one third of Americans get less than seven hours of sleep a night. It's for that reason insufficient sleep has been called a public health epidemic. Today, healthcare is about empowering people to take control of their health. Whether creating a fitness routine, choosing the right procedures and medications, or adhering to treatment for a chronic condition. Capital Blue Cross, dedicated to underwriting Health Smart for the good health of the community. Capital Blue Cross, live fearless. Support also comes from viewers like you. Thank you. They knew that they had to sleep, but it wasn't as much of a problem as it is now. 
In the 1800s, things changed. The Industrial Revolution brought the invention of artificial light, and sleep took a back seat. When the Industrial Revolution in this country happened, the average sleep uh, duration in Americans went down by about two hours. We had the light bulb, so we had artificial light that would allow us to stay up uh, and perform activities when it would have been dark other times. Also was the development of automated work uh, in industries and then shift work. In 1925, Dr. Nathaniel Kleitman, known as the founder of Sleep Research, opened the first sleep lab at the University of Chicago. About 25 years later, in 1953, he and a graduate student discovered REM sleep. The 50s were a really exciting time when they were trying to figure out how to measure it and how to score it, all about sleep stages, how important they were. They still don't know enough, but in the 50s, it was really very exciting. A lot of discoveries. Today, there are still discoveries left to be made about sleep, but we have learned quite a bit. When it's time to sleep, neurons at the base of the brain begin signaling. They appear to turn off the signals that keep us awake. Research also suggests that a chemical builds up in the blood while we're awake and causes drowsiness. This chemical then breaks down while we sleep. Once we're asleep, the brain continues to work. There's a lot of brain activity going on, and I wouldn't at all think that it's dormant. It's not at all dormant. Your brain is doing a lot of business. When you go to sleep, there's a pattern of sleep stages that you go through. During sleep, we pass through five stages, stage one, two, three, four, and rapid eye movement or REM sleep. Adults spend almost 50% of their total sleep in stage two and about 20% in REM sleep. Stage one is light sleep. In this phase, we can be awakened easily. People who wake from this stage of sleep usually remember fragmented visuals and may experience sudden muscle contractions, which are often preceded by a feeling of falling. When we enter stage two sleep, our eye movements stop and our brain waves become slower with occasional bursts of rapid waves called sleep spindles. In stage three, extremely slow brain waves called delta waves begin to appear interspersed with smaller, faster waves. By stage four, the brain produces delta waves almost exclusively. It is very hard to wake someone during stages three and four, which together are called deep sleep. There is no eye movement or muscle activity. People awaken during deep sleep, don't adjust immediately, and often feel disoriented for several minutes after they wake up. Some children experience bedwetting, night terrors, or sleepwalking during deep sleep. When we switch into REM sleep, our breathing becomes more rapid, irregular, and shallow. Our eyes jerk rapidly in various directions, and our limb muscles become temporarily paralyzed. Our heart rate increases, our blood pressure rises. On average, it takes at least 90 minutes to complete a sleep cycle. Well, your brain is doing different things during each stage. Your brain waves look different in each stage. So I don't think that they have really nailed down the importance of why do you have stage one and why do you have stage two but we do know it's important to go through these sleep stages while we don't fully understand the importance of the sleep stages we do know that during these stages the body is repairing muscles consolidating memories and releasing hormones that regulate growth and appetite in other words we know that sleep is important I mean, obviously, we spend about a third of our life asleep. Uh, and historically, in medicine, we've always concentrated on diseases and what's going on in the daytime. Um, but you really can't divorce sleep and wakefulness. So what goes on in sleep can definitely impact how someone is doing in the daytime and vice versa. Getting enough sleep is almost as important as measuring as a nurse as vital signs, you know? Um, or what is needed for good health. Breathing, good water, good food, and sleep. It's that important. So how much sleep do we need? Well, it depends on many factors, including age. Infants require 16 to 18 hours a day. Preschool age children, 11 to 12 hours. School age children, at least 10 hours. Teens, about nine. And adults, including the elderly, need seven to eight. But of course, getting that sleep can be tough.
According to the Centers for Disease Control, one-third of adults say they feel sleepy during the day on a daily basis. But why? Distractions, responsibilities, and stress are a few possible factors, among many others. Today, there are family demands, work demands, and many other things that can interfere with our ability to get enough sleep. Paul Cooley is an ER nurse. I like taking care of people. Um, you see a lot of different things. It's very interesting. Although he loves his job, he's had to suffer through some pretty tough work schedules. When I first started, I had to do three 12-hour shifts. They are split between days and nights, so you'd have to do a stretch of days and then a stretch of nights, which was uh, never fun. When you're doing the switching from days to nights, my wife would definitely say, you look, I'm more irritable. You're being cranky, I'd be short with her. And I'm pretty laid back person, so I would be like, oh yeah, I guess I am, I'm not sleeping. We have an internal rhythm, our circadian rhythm, which governs when we feel awake and when we feel asleep. And if you get too much variation in your sleep patterns from night to night or week to weekend, then you can really start to make that circadian rhythm become disrupted. So then that can lead to a lot of impaired function in the daytime or problems with sleeping at night. I think evolutionary wise, if you look back and back and back and back, everybody went to sleep when the sun went down. Everybody woke up when the sun came up and everybody was fine. Now we don't do that. So our modern life really wreaks havoc with the circadian rhythm. I don't think that enough attention is being given to those industries where people have to stay alert and awake and be safe. Sleep deprivation is considered six hours or less. When I say six hours, I don't mean if you get six hours and five minutes, that's okay, and five hours and 55 minutes is not enough. It's a continuum. Paul's job isn't the only thing in his life capable of disrupting his sleep schedule. But so far, so good. This is Paul Anthony. He's almost six months old, and uh, he's a good sleeper so far. So let's keep at it. Let's keep at it, buddy. Just about 30 miles away, Cat Cricket is also enjoying her new role as parent. But she's having a bit of a different experience when it comes to babies and sleep. Well, we've seen a lot of big changes with our first little baby boy here. Um, prior to that, I loved to sleep. If I could get eight to 10 hours, that would be great for me. Since he's been born, um, he was actually born overnight. So I missed a whole night of sleep. And then uh, from, yeah, from there on out, it was maybe four or five hours a day. So that's obviously a drastic change. He's been kind of a light sleeper right from um, the beginning. When we first brought him home, you know, there's the whole thing about swaddling and do they want to be in that or not, or near you or not. He would sleep maybe two or three hours, and then he'd be up and he'd need to nurse, and then it would be hard to get him to go back to sleep, lots of crying. It's really hard to function when you're only getting a few hours at a time of sleep. You get really angry. Um, you know, when you hear the monitor and you hear him crying, it's like, oh, no, I just want a couple more minutes of sleep. Mommy needs some coffee because she's tired. My mood during the day was not the best. Um, it was hard to be in a good mood. Obviously, when I, you know, see Eli and he's smiling at me, it helps put you back into a good mood. Um, but sometimes it was hard because my husband, um, you know, went back to work after two weeks and I was here all day with Eli trying to deal with getting him to sleep and it was just a little rough. During the day, it's really hard to get him to take a nap. Usually there's no morning nap, so I just have to keep going. But in the afternoon, sometimes he'll take an hour or two, and when he does, I definitely try to take a nap. But it's also hard because you want to get stuff done around the house. You know, you need to clean, you need to do laundry, do the dishes, things like that, so it doesn't pile up. So you're still really not getting enough sleep. <laughs> My 
I always tell patients, while you think that you have to stay up late or get up extra early to perform activities, you're less effective uh, and less efficient at those activities because of the sleep deprivation. You'd be more efficient and more effective if you're getting sleep on a regular basis and really not missing that extra time. It's easy to keep going because you know you're doing it for your child. So you kind of just, I guess your endurance kicks in and you just deal with it. But it's, it's really hard. I found there were times when I was just falling asleep nursing him, falling asleep just sitting in a chair because I just wasn't getting enough sleep. I was worried about driving, having to drive him to doctor's appointments because I knew I was tired and I probably shouldn't have been driving. People who are sleepy don't function as well. It affects your reasonability. The number and severity of workplace accidents also tend to increase during the night shift. Major industrial accidents attributed partly to errors made by fatigued night shift workers include the Exxon Valdez oil spill and the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl nuclear power plant accidents. While sleep deprivation can be caused by work schedules and family obligations, there can also be medical reasons for a lack of sleep. According to the Centers for Disease Control, an estimated 50 to 70 million U.S. adults have sleep or wakefulness disorders. There are over 70 sleep disorders. Three of the most common are insomnia. Insomnia makes it difficult for one to fall asleep and stay asleep. Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea occurs when one's breathing is interrupted during sleep. Snoring is sometimes a sign of sleep apnea. And restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome causes an intense urge to move the legs. Sleep disorders result in sleep deprivation, which in turn has the power to interfere with work, driving, and social activities. No matter what your reason for not getting enough sleep, a lack of it can come at a cost to your health, and that might not be a price you're willing to pay. Our overall health is impacted greatly by the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep that you get. If you don't have good sleep, you don't have good health. Those who are sleep deprived are at risk for heart disease, heart attack, heart failure, irregular heartbeat, high blood pressure, stroke, and diabetes. A lack of sleep or a sleep disorder can also impair your ability to think and learn. Patients that are sleep deprived, whether it's from not getting enough sleep, whether it's from an untreated sleep disorder like sleep apnea, that does affect their cognitive ability and their ability to remember and retain things. It can contribute to depression. In fact, insomnia is one of the first symptoms of depression. Sleep deprivation can lead to weight gain. For instance, if you are sleep deprived, it can cause some insulin resistance, which is pre-diabetic. The hormones that your body makes, leptin and ghrelin, there's a ratio. There's a good ratio and a bad ratio. So if you don't get enough sleep, the ghrelin will be dominant. Ghrelin, too much ghrelin, will affect your appetite, your food choices, and it will cause your body to deposit fat versus burn fat and it can even reduce your body's response to the flu vaccine. For these reasons and more, Dr. Amy Mioli suggests looking into sleep problems. Their sleep is consistently being disrupted and it's certainly to the point where it affects your ability to function in the daytime and affects your ability to function at 100%. Or if you have sleepiness in the daytime, that it impairs upon your ability to do usual activities, that's an indication you've got a problem and should be seen. If somebody is having disrupted sleep, an insomnia complaint, that needs to be investigated as to what's causing it. I mean, insomnia is a symptom, not a disease.
Mioli works with patients at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center Sleep Lab every day. But clearly the patient is asleep at this point. We're looking at the brain waves. We're looking for the various sleep stages. Uh, we're monitoring for muscle tone and limb movement and body position and oxygen levels and heart rate and rhythm and breathing and, and aspects of breathing. Um, and from that, we can even fine tune those measurements to get even more detail if we need to. From the results of sleep studies, she can diagnose a sleep disorder and figure out how to treat it. Can you lean forward a little bit, please? Most of them can be effectively treated, some with medication, some with devices, some with behavioral modifications. Do you need anything else? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So we know sleep is important. That doesn't mean it's easy to get the recommended amount. Still, there are a few steps you can take to increase your odds of getting enough rest. Back at Kat's house, she's trying to combat her sleep deprivation with a good old cup of joe. That's better. I have to say, for me, it's pure adrenaline that keeps me going. Just that I know I have to take care of him and keep going. Coffee is obviously really good. And other than that, I mean, that's just what I do. I just have to keep functioning. And so far, we have been for six months. Paul also feels the need for coffee and definitely made it a part of his overnight shifts at the hospital. I did all try the techniques to try to stay awake. I would drink coffee. I would like work a cup of coffee in around three o'clock in the morning. That would be like, okay, because it's really, I got four more hours. We do things to help us combat that, like caffeine, which then interferes with your sleep. In fact, there are a lot of things we do in today's world that interfere with our sleep. Mostly, I find that people don't think it is important enough and they won't go to bed at a decent time and allow themselves enough time to sleep, even when they can. They're too busy. They watch television. They spend an awful lot of time on the computer. They'll fall asleep watching television instead of going to bed. In kids, especially teenagers, electronics are probably the biggest thing that impact upon their sleep. They're on their cell phones or their iPads and texting and watching movies when they should be trying to fall asleep. Instead of talking about the don'ts of good sleep hygiene, let's talk about the do's. Do maintain a sleep schedule. Go to sleep at the same time every day, approximately, and wake up at the same time every day. If you sleep in two hours every weekend and go to bed two hours later every weekend, you're interjecting jet lag, basically, into your life. So try to keep your habits pretty much the same. And that goes for people who have shift work types of jobs. Try to maintain the same shift all the time. Do put the electronics down before bed and leave them out of the bedroom. You shouldn't be on a computer for about two hours before going to bed. Most of the time people are checking their emails and their messages and everything right before they go to bed. People who work in the information technology industry have a very difficult time because they are on the computers all day long and then they come home and then they might have a lot of hobbies which they would offer to say do websites and things like that. So they're on the computer all day long and then they're on the computer most of the evening and then they have a hard time going to sleep because their melatonin has been degraded by the computer light. Melatonin is naturally produced by your body and you need melatonin in order to go to sleep. If you don't have enough of it, you might have difficulty and you might have difficulty staying asleep if you don't have enough because it's broken down while you're sleeping. I know some of my patients will wake up in the middle of the night because they can't stay asleep sometimes and what do they do? They turn on their computer and play solitaire. Like, really? <laughs> That's something that you should not be doing or they read their Nook or their Kindle. And they don't realize that the blue light from the computer screens are not 
helping their melatonin. Do take the TV out of the bedroom. A flickering television actually can be picked up through your eyelids and that shows up on your brain waves. Same thing with sound. So having that TV off while you're trying to sleep is important. Do make your sleep environment comfortable both in your choice of bedding and temperature. You want to keep the room rather cool. Cool tends to be better for our sleep patterns. And do start a sleep routine. Have a ritual, sort of like putting your child to bed. You have a bath, put your pajamas on, brush your teeth, get a story, go to bed. Adults should have a routine that will promote your ability to fall asleep naturally. Our lives are very complicated. There's a lot of people who are suffering from anxiety. And anxiety, if you can't shut that off before you go to bed, it's going to be tough. Your mind is very strong. It'll keep you awake. It'll wake you up. So being able to calm down is really important. These days, Paul Cooley is finding it easier to get in good sleep. I now work 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. shift. I just love it because it's consistent. It's improved my quality of life, <laughs> certainly. Cat Prickett is still working on a full night's sleep, but she's getting closer. Now that he's at six months, kind of like a switch has been flipped, and he's Aww. starting to sleep for longer stretches. I think we're up to about seven hours straight, so I'm really thankful for that. In the next few months, what do I hope? I hope that he starts sleeping through the night for 10 hours and that he'll start taking naps during the day. It is absolutely, at the end of the day, completely worth it to have him and to be sleep deprived because he has just completely changed our lives for the better. I'd like to thank all of our guests for sharing their knowledge and experiences on Health Smart, the importance of sleep. For more information on this show or to watch full episodes of Health Smart, you can head to our website, witf.org. And of course, you can always enjoy Health Smart anytime, anywhere. With the PBS iPhone and iPad apps, you can watch Health Smart programs free and with little interruption. Go to witf.org slash mobile for details. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, it had a lot of good information on it that I am going to go back over. So now I am going to uh, share my, um, my presentation and we're going to go over a few things, but not before Bentley, of course, joins us. Okay, so we talked about this being parenting and mental health session, sleep edition, and we did just watch uh, this video. And now I want to talk a little bit about this book. So a lot of what um, I put together tonight is based off of this book. Dr. Walker is considered one of the world's experts in sleep. He is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley and the founder and the director of the Center for Human Sleep Science and the author of this book, Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams. He has 60 years of scientific research under his belt to support the information that I'll share with you tonight. His belief is that sleep science is not understood, which is why he is motivated to write this book. So, this book was set out uh, to kind of explain reasons why you should sleep rather than rules, right? So this is meant to be convincing and this is parenting and mental health. So there is a connection. You saw some of it in the, the video. It, it showed a couple parents how lack of sleep was impacting their lives at home, is impacting their ability to parent. Sometimes you have to get through it, right? A, a baby that's staying up in the middle of the night there aren't always solutions. One thing I would say is if you are fortunate enough to have a partner that is living with you and shares the parenting responsibilities, find ways for that partner to share the responsibilities a little bit more, uh, maybe not in the middle of the night, but maybe during the day, right? More and more uh, places of work are giving paternity leave. And this is something to really think about when you're trying to balance out finding a way to get enough sleep, because it doesn't always have to be all at once. Eight hours does not have to come 
from one chunk of time. It can come in smaller chunks. However, we do want to get fairly large chunks, but you can take significant naps that can help you get to that. So let's continue. So some basic facts of sleep. Dr. Walker does address the relationship between sleep and productivity. Um, he cites a lot of laboratory and workplace studies that have provided him with some pretty clear and certain truths. First of all, the lack of sleep has been considered by the World Health Organization as a global epidemic. The average uh, US citizen sleeps only about 6.5 hours per night. And that sleep, as you saw in the movie, has been eroded significantly over the past 60 years as we have developed more uh, technology that emits light, right? So during, uh, back in the 1800s, we started to develop more ways to have lights on. We started having gas lanterns in the, in the roadways and gas lights in the houses. And then uh, eventually we started having more consistent electricity through houses. The industrial age created a lot of electricity and light. Yet in the past 60 years, with the dawn of the computer and smartphones and other electronic devices, we really have impacted our sleep. And as you saw in the video, our melatonin production. So we've already learned that sleep is vital and it's essential from an evolutionary standpoint, right? We can't just lop off 25% of necessary sleep that we need. We have to find ways to make it work. Otherwise our health will degrade. So there've been studies across millions of people showing that one clear thing, that the shorter you sleep, the shorter your life's gonna be. And certainly the shorter you sleep, the less quality of life you're gonna have. If you sleep less, as Dr. Walker would say, Dr. Walker said, if you sleep less, you will be dead sooner. Lack of sleep kills you more quickly. I know that's very extreme and it's true. It works faster than a poor diet or a lack of exercise. As this the movie showed, and I wanted to put it up here again, we are the only species on the planet that deprives ourselves of sleep. Uh, I can use Bentley a therapy dog as an example. Uh, when I'm working from home, she's behind me sleeping. And yes, she sleeps and she wakes up, she sleeps and she wakes up, but she sleeps a lot. And you know what? She looks great for an English bulldog. Anyway, sleep cycles are also genetic. So this is something that I, was, I wasn't as aware of and I wanted to share with everybody. What that means is I certainly see it in my family. I'm a morning person. So I've always gotten up somewhere between five and eight in the morning. Um, and I like to go to bed early. I've always wanted to go to sleep somewhere between eight and 10 and 10's pushing. Um, when I was a little bit younger, 10 o'clock was more my norm, like college, high school, that was more my norm. And getting up was a little bit later. So there's also times of your life where your sleep shifts a little bit the the sleep cycle and your and genetic variability means that if me being a morning sleeper i have one child in my house that is a morning person my son ever since he was a toddler and started sleeping through the night and we get up in the morning he's always gotten up somewhere between five and seven in the morning he always gets up early no matter what time he goes to sleep so i'm very conscious of not letting him stay up late with his friends because I know he will get a decreased amount of sleep. And as you heard in the movie, there are lots of reasons why, and we'll go back over some of the reasons, other reasons why it's so important to get enough sleep. As we get older, sleep efficiency decreases. So what does that mean? That just means that while we're asleep, we, we don't get all the benefits of sleep as well. So what that means is that we might have to go to bed earlier and sleep longer to get the same benefits. Uh, certainly, as you get older, you will hear, hear people saying they have to get up and use the bathroom during the night, things like that. And that means you might have to go to bed earlier or schedule some sort of nap into the, the day. I have all these facts um, from Dr. Walker's books and studies um, about sleep. And one study that I found, and I'm hoping I can find it, that I found particularly interesting. Um, and of course now I'm not gonna be able to find it. Uh, it was around a uh, siesta. So they said the most natural sleep pattern is to 
sleep for about seven hours during the night and then take one one hour nap during the day. And that is a very common practice in Europe. They have siestas. And what they found uh, is that in a study of 23,000 Greek adults, they saw that there was a 37% increased risk of death from heart disease across a six year period when the siestas were taken away. So for 23,000 people, which is a pretty significantly large study, when they took away that siesta and they only got seven hours or less of sleep, they increased their risk of heart disease by 37%. That's a pretty big increase. So last thing, 1.2 million car crashes happen in the US due to drowsy driving. And as you saw in the movie, uh, quite a few of those are in younger adults mostly because they stay up later, but they're still forced to get up early to either go to school or go to work. So that's something to be considered when you're dealing with your kid. I know sometimes we can't shift the schedule that is put forth for our kids, right? Our kids, my children are in elementary school and they have to get on the bus around seven o'clock in the morning. So they have to get up early. So what does that mean for us? We go to bed earlier. And for my daughter, who's a night owl, it's a struggle. And we are always trying to find ways to help her get ready for sleep, which means we have to prepare her earlier. And we have to really create a very consistent routine for her that tells her body that that's what she needs to do. So what sleep is it? Sleep nourishes the mind and the body and is actually a very active process. So it's not just the absence of wakefulness. It's not just a time where our body turns off. It actually turns off conscious processes. So that gets a break. But what goes on are a lot of other involuntary processes that our body is completely engaged in while we're sleeping. So because of that, if we take drugs, including sleeping pills uh, or drink alcohol to try and induce sleep, it actually inhibits full sleep cycles and then reduces the effectiveness of what sleep does. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in later slides. You, another thing sleep isn't, you can't, you can't make it up. Sleep is not like money. You can't lose a bunch of money and then just make it back and put it back in the bank. So if you only get four hours of sleep one night, the next night you can't sleep for you know, over 10 hours and say, oh, okay, I got it back. It doesn't work. You've just lost it. You just have to gradually get back in your cycle. And every, every night that you don't get a lot of sleep, you're taking away from your consistent sleeping cycle, which then will make it harder to get back into one. So for instance, three nights of eight hours of sleep can't make up for four nights of six hours of sleep. Um, Another thing that I want to point out, some people, I know I grew up this way, if you took a nap, you were lazy. Well, as I was just saying earlier, one of the most effective and most commonly naturally sought after sleep cycles is to sleep for a period of about seven hours and then to take an hour nap during the day. If you think about it, for a lot of folks, it makes sense. There are There is this common period where we get tired during the day. I used to think, and I was taught that it was lazy to take naps as I've been able to be more flexible with my work schedule. Certainly when I'm working from home, I have been able to work in 20 minute power naps, which has become extremely restorative. And if I know I have an alarm that's going to go off, you know, that's going to wake me up. It really does help with me uh, getting right back in the flow of work. I've done a lot of study around flow, which is or an athlete is considered getting in the zone. It's this period of where, you know, your essence of self kind of disappears and you're just getting things done seamlessly. And in the study of flow, it's found that doing these cycles of really intense hard work followed by something restorative and short naps, like 20 minute naps are considered extremely restorative. And at that really intense time, so for your, for your students, maybe your older students, they have to study for a big exam, have them study for their big exam for 90 minutes or a little bit longer. 
and then have them take a nap right after, and I'll explain why. Going to sleep isn't a time to digest your meals. Part of this is because, and I'll talk about this in more detail in a little bit, is that when you go to sleep on a full stomach, many of the physical benefits of sleep are diminished because your body's spending all of its physical energy digesting your food. And when you use sleep as a uh, time to digest, your body isn't actively using as much energy as it can be while you're awake. So that food is immediately put into fat stores. The last thing I want to mention, I say tanning. Laying out in the sun and falling asleep does not have the same impact, the same quality of sleep that you get when you lay in a bed and you're sleeping in a dark, cool, quiet place. So I just wanted to point that out. If someone's like, oh, well, you know, I go outside and I lay outside in the sun for an hour and that's, you know, how that works. Well, unfortunately, because you're in the sun, especially in hot areas, being in the sun will uh, cause your body to have to deal with that radiation from the sun instead of doing all these restorative things that we know sleep does for you now. Okay, so here's, here's the big slide. A lot of this stuff was brought up during the movie. Sleep plays a vital role in good health and well-being throughout our lives. And the way you feel while awake depends in part, actually to great in great part, to what happens while you're sleeping and how restorative your sleep actually is. During sleep, your body is working hard to support healthy brain function and maintain a healthy physical health. Uh, in children and teens, sleep also supports growth and development. Uh, some of your children can attest to that when they wake up in the middle of the night with growing pains. It's literally your body's in the midst of a massive growth spurt, so much so that it causes these cramps. So your kids know it too. Um, getting inadequate sleep over time can raise the risk for long, for chronic long-term health problems. And many of people to appear around here, certainly in Western culture, to be proud of a lack of sleep. And, you know, oh, I'm busy or gosh, I barely got any sleep last night. It becomes a badge of honor, especially if you are still functional. Unfortunately, what I would say about that is eventually your body is keeping score and eventually your body will start to react to that lack of sleep, whether it's just causing you to look a lot older or you start to develop a lot of these things on this list from what happens when you get six hours of less sleep. First of all, the list of problems is huge, right? It's lack of less, you know, getting less than six hours of sleep a night is linked to things like a diminished immune system, which causes you, which basically means your, any vaccine is not going to be as effective. You're more likely to get infections. You are more likely or doubles your risk of cancer. It increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart failure, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. It increases your risk of stroke, depression, many mental health issues like bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, and even increases your risk uh, for suicide among other mental health conditions. Your decreased Decreased sleep increases your irritability, which we all know, right? That's what it's like. It also increases your desire to eat because when you don't sleep, you're not getting rid of the cortisol in your body, which causes you, and when you're not sleeping, your body is seeking energy. So it looks for the type of energy that isn't good for us, those monosaccharides, those breads and carbohydrates that are easy to digest because we don't want to spend a lot of energy because we don't have any energy. All these things happen. So if you're trying to diet and you're not getting enough sleep, you're going to not only crave the bad stuff, but in the little time that you do sleep, your body is going to go after your body mass to, to get energy versus getting rid of the body fat. So because your body fat is being stored thinking, gosh, we're going to need extra, extra energy because we're not getting a lot of sleep. So we got to store extra energy. It also increases the bad bacteria in our body, both internally and externally. So we all have bacteria on our skin. 
And a lot of that's good bacteria, which actually helps us fight when we get small cuts, helps us fight getting an infection. We have good bacteria inside our bodies as well. When we don't get enough sleep, we lose good bacteria and we increase the bad bacteria. And it's all about balance. So, so many things can uh, happen when we're not getting enough sleep. When workers, so if you are someone that is a manager or if even, or you run a team or you supervise or own a company, the reason you want to make sure your workers are getting enough sleep, it's very clear that underslept individuals are not going to be successful. Uh, Dr. Walker uh, has done many research studies recently on sleepless workers and he notes that in some of his reports that chronic exhaustion and fatigue due to lack of sleep caused most first world nations to lose about 2% of their gross domestic product. That's about $411 billion in the U.S. So lack of sleep costs the U.S. in gross income, $411 billion with a B dollars. So if we solved our sleep deprivation issue in the U.S., we could also almost double the budget for education, or we could make huge repairs in our infrastructure or work on our healthcare system or so many other things, right? Sleepless workers are less likely to take on challenging problems. They are less likely to be good teammates. They produce fewer creative solutions. They exert less effort when uh, working in group, I already said that. They are also most more likely to lie, cheat, and engage in deviant behavior. Less sleep means a less charismatic leader. So I know what you're thinking right now. Oh, well, we always hear about these, you know, tech gurus stay up all night and come up with this genius idea. Maybe, maybe that happens and maybe that's an anomaly. Maybe that person was so smart that they were able to do that even with a lack of sleep. Think about how many more creative ideas they would come up with if they actually got sleep. Some of the most, some of the richest people in the world, Richard Branson, I'm gonna use as an example, use sleep as a time to solve big problems. So what they do is they ruminate on these big problems right before bed, and then they go to sleep with notebooks paper notebooks, by the way, by their bed. And in the middle of the night, when they, they end up dreaming about these big problems, they find ways, they've you know developed ways to wake them, themselves up and write down the answers and then go back to sleep. And so while their sleep is broken up a little bit, they make sure they get enough sleep throughout the day. And they're actually able to come up with some really creative solutions because they're using sleep as a tool to be creative. What about sleepless families? And we saw some of it in the movie. Sleepless families argue more. They're less resilient, which means they're less able to deal with the stress of everyday life. They, the sleepless families get sick more often, right? Your immune system is down. They're more likely to be deceitful. Kids that don't get enough sleep, don't have the creativity to solve problems in, in ways that adhere to rules and boundaries. So they end up trying to break the rules just to get it done. In other words, they try and take a shortcut. Parents are less likely to set up boundaries that work because they can't be creative because they lack sleep. Families that don't get enough sleep are more likely to take things personal, which means you argue more, also means you're less empathetic to what's going on with the other person. You're less helpful. And families that get less sleep are more likely to divorce and develop mental health challenges. So all of these things can be solved or at least massively uh, increase your happiness by just getting more sleep. So let's look at that. So what does eight hours of sleep a real eight hours of being asleep, okay, do. It preps our brain for learning. Uh, not just the learning that's about to happen, so getting sleep before a test, but it also, as I mentioned with Richard Branson, if you study and try and learn something and then go to sleep closely thereafter, 
it can then turn the learning into uh, a long-term memory. In fact, three days of solid sleep helps memories get committed to long-term memory better than not doing it. The emotional circuits of our brain are also modified during sleep. Our amygdala, which is a, a little almond-shaped part of our brain underneath our cerebral cortex, which is the wrinkly part of our brain, and it's, and it's an emotional center for our brain. It's part of the limbic system. And the amygdala is reconnected to our prefrontal cortex, which is right here. And that's the part where executive function happens, where planning and organization happens. They connect when we go to good night's sleep, which basically means uh, we put a break on our emotional gas, right? Being super emotional, being driven by our emotions. And we're looking at things more logically. So when we're sleep deprived, that connection severed, which means we're basically functioning completely emotionally and without any break, without any logic. And we all know what that looks like. The benefits of sleep don't end in the brain. There are many physiological systems that are rebooted during sleep. Deep non-REM sleep is the best uh, best type of sleep to help with uh, blood pressure um, because it slows your heart rate. It also allows us to release a lot of a variety of restorative chemicals and hormones, which include growth hormone that restores the cells. So if you are ending up getting a lot of deep sleep, your, your body is regenerating. This isn't just something that happens in kids that are still growing and developing. This happens in adults too. So people that get more sleep, look younger, longer. And you all can test this out. Go without, go six hours or less for a few nights. Take a picture of yourself before where you've gotten enough sleep for three days. Go three days without with six hours or less and then take a picture of yourself in the same light, right? In the same outfit and see how you look. Okay. And there's, you know, there have been studies that are done just even in perception. People tend to look attractive and healthier when they're getting eight hours of sleep consistently. Uh, sleep also regulates our metabolic system and our insulin levels. What that means is that, um, well, and I can tell you that studies have shown that that one week of five to six hours of sleep a night, just one week, will disrupt a person's blood sugar so much that it'll classify them as pre-diabetic. So this illustrates where just eating the wrong foods, it can take months or even years for someone to be in that pre-diabetic phase if they're getting the right amount of sleep. Imagine now the combination of not eating well and not getting enough sleep. Think about how much more quickly you get into a bad state health-wise. So a lot of these are just the opposite of the other ones, right? If we get enough sleep, we have increased creativity, increased problem solving, we reduce our chance of accidental death. Uh, people that work anxious are much more likely to die from accidental death than people that don't work a night shift. And it's not necessarily because of the nature of what night shift people are doing. Some people aren't doing something that is inherently dangerous during the night, but they have more risk of accidental death. It also, so for your kids that are high school age and taking those SAT scores, as there was a study done where in getting better sleep can increase your SAT score. There was a study that was done where they just, uh, the they took the SATs and they took the SATs again and all they did was increase the student's amount of sleep by one hour. It increased their score by 159 points. That's pretty impressive. Other things to note, and I know I'm just giving you so much information, but it's all so important. Uh, a lack of sleep for both men and women can um, disrupt the reproductive system. So if you're a couple that is trying to get pregnant, they're trying to have kids, get more sleep. And I know that might go against the time when you have to try and make children, but if you are struggling with that, before you go to all the fertility drugs, just try and get a week or two of eight hours of sleep. 
without drinking, without using any supplements and see what happens. The right amount of sleep helps with appetite regulation and food consumption. In fact, sleep deprivation causes an imbalance of leptin, which tells your brain that when you're satisfied. So, and there's another chemical which tells your brain that you're not satisfied. So when you don't get enough sleep, you're not only being told you're not satisfied, but you're also being told you're still hungry because those chemicals aren't being produced properly. So people that don't get enough sleep tend to eat 300 to 500 more calories per day. That's a lot. And they tend to eat the more carbohydrate high types of food. So they're not even the right types of food. One night of four hours of sleep, one night of four hours of sleep will drop your cancer fighting immune cells, which are the cells in your body, they're called killer cells. They actually go and attack cancer cells. If you get a, a night of sleep that's only about four hours, your cancer fighting immune cells drop by 70, 70%. The link between sleep deprivation and cancer is so strong that the World Health Organization has recently classified nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen because it disrupts sleep rate rhythm so much. Five hours of sleep per night before you get the flu shot will reduce your body's antibody response to less than 50%, rendering that vaccine largely ineffective and probably causing you to get the flu instead of building up an immunity to it. Similarly, with five hours, you are 200 to 300% more likely to catch a cold than someone who gets eight hours of sleep. Physical skills improve after a solid night's sleep. Studies show that you look more attractive. Uh, dreams are considered overnight therapy. That's when your body basically takes all the emotions of the day and all of these images and all of these memories and starts to process them. So if you don't give yourself time to process it, you're more likely to go to fight or flight when you don't need to. So, so many reasons to get eight hours of sleep. So I know you're asking, how do you do it? Well, as the video said, make sure you're getting a consistent bedtime and a consistent wake up time. We have a lot of these uh, devices that we wear on our wrists that help us do that. I know the Apple Watch and also the Fitbit both have sleep calculators. You can use those to help you. I know for those of you that are cold all the time, you're not gonna like this, but cool temperatures, about 68 degrees is what they recommend to, to have uh, the best type of sleep because your core body temperature does drop uh, two to three degrees uh, in order to initiate sleep. So if you're already in a cold room, that will help you to get your core temperature down so that you'll go to sleep. Uh, so if you take um, a hot bath right before bed, that's actually, uh, or hot bath as opposed to a hot shower, uh, that can actually disrupt sleep a little bit. However, if you take a hot bath, you're gonna cause your blood vessels to open up, which will allow what we call vasodilation. And it'll allow when you get out of the shower for you to get cooler more quickly, believe it or not. So you'll get that cool core temperature more quickly and help you go to sleep. Um, keep it dark. We've already talked about this. No technology, at least an hour before you go to sleep, okay? I tell this to my folks in my office all the time. I know it's hard. You want to send text messages, check things right before you go to bed. Just make that an hour before you go to bed and then turn your phone off. If you have to, plug your phone in on the opposite side of the room so you aren't tempted. If you wake up in the middle of the night, it also keeps you away from temptation of picking your phone up to look at what time it is. If your phone is your alarm clock, buy an old school alarm clock, or if you have a smart device on your wrist, you can use uh, that device to vibrate, which will also wake you up, or leave the alarm on your cell phone, but keep it on the other side of the room. So you have to get up to turn it off. That'll make sure you get up. Um, 
If you get up and you're awake for more than 20 minutes, get out of your bed, move around, don't get on a screen. Uh, and no more caffeine after 12 noon. I know there are a lot of you out there that say, oh, I can drink caffeine right before I go to bed and I can still fall asleep. Yeah, you might still be able to fall asleep, but you're not gonna get the same quality of sleep. So allow yourself to get the best quality of sleep possible, okay? If you are someone that's coping with insomnia, all those proper sleep tips, work on them. Those are all what we call sleep hygiene. So being consistent about bedtime and awake time, cooler room, dark room, no blue light, no technology uh, an hour before. And the way you can kind of build up to that is just making sure that you create an hour long sleep routine. Take, you know, brushing your teeth, maybe taking a hot shower to get that vasodilation, uh, putting on your pajamas. You can read a book that's not blue light and have put a dimmer light bulb in your light or use a small reading light when you read before bed, okay? An hour before you can take the melatonin. So do all these things that go into a sleep routine um, that will help you give yourself that hour. So Dr. Walker does suggest a few things. He does address sleeping pills and he explains that there are some things that can be prescribed for sleep, sedative hypnotics, and they're just like alcohol. They will knock you out. So you will get a lot of deep sleep and it's better than no sleep. However, it does not, um, it does not mimic healthy sleep. So if you're not getting sleep at all and you need sleeping pills, great. There are a lot of natural solutions like melatonin, valerian root tea is helpful. Uh, GABA is another one. Uh, GABA is um, a supplement you can get. These are all natural remedies that can kind of help. Again, they're not gonna knock you out, but they're giving your body the things it needs to kind of say, oh wait, okay, I'm, and this can all be built in to your sleep routine at night. Things with kids, I don't suggest letting them stay on a screen right up until bedtime and then having them pop melatonin, right? That's not going to help them. And it might not help them stay asleep. You want to build this sleep routine with them. It's just as important as it was for your five-year-old as it is for your 15-year-old or your 18-year-old. You've got to have a sleep routine. Put things at the end of the day that have to be done. And napping, if you can, if your teenager comes home and wants to take an hour nap, great. But just make sure it's right after they get home from school and you don't take a nap later than three because then you're going to be up late, okay? That, uh, and the other thing that I mentioned here is cognitive behavioral therapy for sleep. If you're really struggling with in insomnia, if you go to the Psychology Today website, you can look up CBTI. There are people that are certified in this. And it, it really is a powerful tool to fighting insomnia. And it can be a good alternative to using a sleeping pill or to help battle insomnia. Uh, a lot of my clients uh, talk about having racing thoughts at night. So what I often suggest is for them to put a journal by the bed and also have that little reading lamp. And to keep the journal by your bed so that you can write all those thoughts down. Just write the thoughts down. You can do this with your kids too. Even if they're little, they can draw a picture of what they're thinking about, or they can write their thoughts down as best they can in their journal. And then they shut the journal and then they try and go to sleep. What they're doing is that they're telling their brain, hey, I hear you. I've gotten... I've gotten the message, I've written it down so I won't forget about it. If you need to keep a notepad because you're afraid you're gonna forget to do something the next day, keep a you know paper and pencil by your bed and just write it down when you think of it so that you can let it go and go right back to sleep instead of ruminating on it and thinking about it for at what will seem like hours and hours. So I'm gonna end there. We really dove into sleep. It is so important as you've learned uh, if you have any questions related to sleep, bring it up when you go to a therapy session or bring it up with your doctor the next time you come into Bay Community. They will have lots of answers for you and lots of suggestions 
Uh, if you have any questions about sleep after this, please post them in the Facebook page and we can address them. I have so many more facts about sleep uh, and I'm happy to do a talk at any school about sleep as well. Uh, I am a huge, huge proponent of getting enough sleep and I hope this has convinced you to do the same. So have a great night. I hope all of you are going to start ready, getting your kids and yourselves ready for bed after we get off of this. Start counting down that hour or so. Uh, have a great night and sleep well.